Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you to this um, today's session. Our first speaker this morning is Anne-Laure Delibar. Uh, she holds a PhD from Paris from 2007 with Pierre-Louis Lyons as an advisor. Last year, she spent at the Courant Institute, and today she will talk about uh, joint work with Nassim Asmodi from Courant. She's now back in Europe at the Col Normale Supérieure in Paris. So please, the floor is yours. Is it working? Yep. Okay. So thank you very much to the organizers for their very kind invitation. It was my first time in Latin America and I have, I've had a, a wonderful week. So um, I'm going to present some work that I did with uh, Nader Masmoudi over the, the last year, which is about separation for the stationary parental equation. So let me first explain, oh, so I will start with uh, explaining what separation is and why it's interesting. Then uh, try to give some insight about the previous attempts that have been made at describing separation. Then I will present our result and the ideas behind the proof and give a sketch of proof. So uh, first a picture of separation, which is from the French research agency, Honora. So what you're seeing here is the cross section of the flow so here in black, you can see a cylinder, okay, which is so an, an obstacle. And here you can see the streamlines of the flow. And so what uh, I would like to point out to you is that, so the flow is moving, moving from here to here. As it approaches the cylinder, at first the flow remains attached to it, okay? And then at some point around here and here, you see that the flow somehow detaches itself from the cylinder. Okay, you can see the streamlines moving there and there. And here you see some kind of, I, I, either some large eddies, large swirls, or some kind of microstructure, which is typical of turbulence. So um, this is typically what is called separation, and it happens for fluids with, uh, flow, uh, with low viscosity around an obstacle in the presence of an adverse pressure gradient. So I will explain in a few minutes what that is. And let me just point out right now that what happens after the flow has separated itself from the obstacle is a widely open problem from a mathematical point of view. Okay, so I, uh, although I would like to, I won't be able to describe what happens here. Okay, so the flow might be turbulent, it might be laminar, We'd, don't really know there are different regimes which are possible, but in any case, even when the flow is laminar, what happens here is largely unknown. So what I will be interested in today is what happens for laminar flows right before separation. So say in this very small area here. And, in the, and the goal will be to explain what are the mechanisms behind separation, okay? So why is that interesting? So mathematically, uh, it falls within the large area of studying the vanishing viscosity limit in the Navier-Stokes equation, so the transition from Navier-Stokes to Euler. And from in a, an industrial point of view, boundary layer separation is not something which is very desirable because usually in, it increases drag. Okay, so my uh, very naive understanding of this is that uh, if you have some kind of boundary layer separation, the obstacle will appear bigger than it really is, okay, because uh, its shape as seen from the outer flow would be along the lines of separation, okay. Uh, but you can also understand this in a more quantitative way by computing the pressure drag on the obstacle. So the, the goal of engineers has been to design surfaces which will delay flow separation and keep the flow attached to the body as long as possible. So this is where uh, I, don't really understand how what, what they're doing because uh, basically because uh, I don't have a very good understanding of turbulence. So what they're doing is that they're creating a turbulent flow near the obstacle, and the physical idea behind that is that if you have a turbulent flow, then separation uh, will be harder to achieve. 
okay? Uh, separation occurs more easily for a, for a laminar flow. So what they're doing is they're creating very small eddies near the obstacle. So th this is why you have fur on the tennis ball, why you have dimples on the golf ball, so that you can create very small uh, vorticity, patches of vorticity near the obstacle, so that you create a turbulent flow and then you don't have separation, okay? So I won't talk about that today, but this is just to explain you why people have been inter interested in separation. And so, like I said, my goal will be to study laminar flows, separation for laminar flows, right before separation. <clears throat> so, mathematically, the framework will be the one of uh, the stationary Prontal equations, which were derived by Prontal in 1904. At the, uh, and he presented his work at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Heidelberg. So, he was not really a mathematician, he was more of an engineer, but he had a tremendous insight into uh, uh, flows in general, and in particular, Navier-Stokes and Euler equations. And so his um, proposition was that if you consider uh, a flow which obeys the Navier-Stokes equation, but with a very small viscosity here, nu, okay, so nu is going to zero. So as you let nu going go to zero, formally what you obtain in the limit is the Euler equations. But as you know, if you do that, you cannot uh, ask for the flow to be identically zero on the obstacle, okay? Because for the Euler equation, you can only assume that the normal velocity is zero. You only have a non-penetration condition on the obstacle, okay? So if you want to um, compute some kind of approximate solution, then you will have to add something in the vicinity of the obstacle, and this is where the boundary layer equations come in, okay? So his idea was that, so far from the obstacle, you get the Euler flow with a vanishing tangential velocity, but a non-vanishing, uh, excuse me, a, a vanishing normal viscosity, but a non-vanishing tangential velocity. Okay, let me draw a picture. And then close to the obstacle, you have something else. So this is the obstacle, okay? So say from a far distance, uh, a reasonable distance from the obstacle, you have a tangential flow, which is the Euler flow, and which has a non-zero tangential velocity. And then close to the obstacle, you have a very small boundary layer in which the viscous effects are important. and so that the, velo the total velocity is zero near the obstacle, okay? So here, you have something which goes like this. So velo the velocity is zero here. It, it increases so as to reach the, 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 the Euler velocity at the end of the boundary layer. And when you do the scaling, you realize that in order for the um, viscous effects to balance the advection, this needs to be of order square root of nu. Okay, so his ansatz was the one which is uh, written here, and when you plug this into the equations, you get what is called now the Pontal system, <coughs> which looks a bit like the Navier-Stokes equation because you have here this advection term, here you have the rescaled viscous term, so capital Y is the rescaled normal variable, here, this is not, uh, say, a, a Lagrange multiplier associated to this incompressibility constraint. It's a source term which is given and which is the pressure resulting from the Euler flow, okay? So this is given, okay? So as you leave the boundary layer, you retrieve the Euler flow and you are zero on the obstacle. Let me just stress a couple of things here. This is not a system. This is really a scalar equation, okay? And because you can retrieve V from U by integrating this incompressibility constraint, so this is more like a non-local scalar equation than a system, okay? And the other thing that I want to point out is that the time-dependent version of this is very badly behaved. It has strong instabilities in, say, sub -LF spaces. So this has been some ongoing research for the past few years by uh, Emmanuel Grenier, David Girard-Barret, Emmanuel Tormy, 
uh, a lot of other people. Uh, but this is not what I want to talk about here because I want to study only the stationary version of this. So what I'm going to say is unrelated with the, the instability properties of the time-dependent system. So if you want to study this stationary system, so it's the same as the slide before, it's just so that you have it uh, in front of you. So like I said, it's a non-local scalar equation, and in fact you can interpret x here, which is the, vari the tangential variable, as a time-like variable, and consider this as an evolution equation. Okay? So if you, uh, to get some intuition of this, say that you drop here this term, which is a, somehow a, a transport term, so you see that you have a diffusion-like equation. And so you expect it to be well posed as long in the, in the, in the forward sense, uh, as long as UP is strictly positive, okay? Because you have a heat-like equation. And this is exactly what happens, and it's a result from Olenek in 1962. <coughs> Sorry. So if you're starting from a strictly positive initial data, with a strictly positive derivative at point zero, and if everything is smooth, and if you have a compatibility condition, don't focus on that. It's really to have a, to avoid any kind of singularity at point, um, at the initial point. <coughs> <coughs> then you can prove well posedness on a small interval. And moreover, if the right hand side here is strictly is positive, then you have global well posedness. And again, this is understandable. It's because <coughs> I'm sorry. If the right hand side is positive, then you will grow. So if you start from th something which is positive and that grows, it remains positive, and so you can iterate this process and prove global well posedness. Okay, so in that case, you have no separation at all. Okay? So I will be uh, interested in the, um, the opposite sign, so the case where you have something which is negative here, so typically minus one, so dp over dx equals one, because that's the case when you have an adverse pressure gradient which leads you to some possible separation phenomenon. So here is the heuristics behind separation. Um, I'm considering monotone solutions and I will come back to this in a, in a few moments. So this drawing is uh, exactly the same as the one which is here. So this is why it should be capital Y, really. So it's uh, <coughs> the normal variable, and this is U, okay? So what I'm drawing here is the profile of the, of the velocity. This is at point X equals zero. This is at some later time before separation. This is at the point of separation, and this is after separation. So what happens is that, as indicated by the arrows here, the pressure gradient will have a tendency to um, lower your flow, okay? It will uh, decrease along the, uh, along the boundary. So, as you can see, it flattens the profile of the viscosity, of the, of the velocity. So that here, the, if you look at u in terms of y, the, say for instance, the derivative at point zero is lower, okay? And Generally, what happens is that you arrive at some point, x star, such that du over dy at that point is exactly zero. And this is what is called the separation point in the physics literature. And it's because if you go beyond that point, what happens is that in, you have the following profile for the, for the velocity. And in this hatched area here, u is negative, okay? So from a mathematical point of view, you don't want to have u negative because this means that you have some kind of backwards heat equation which is ill-posed, so that's bad, obviously. And it's, co it's called uh, also separation because here you can see that you have u equals zero at some, uh, for some positive y, okay? So this corresponds to the separation line, okay? This means that you have some kind of line which would go like this okay, along which u is zero, and this is exactly uh, the, the, the line of separation. Okay, so there's a curve y equals f of x, such that u, p, y, f of x is zero. Under that, u is negative. Above that, it's positive, and that's what separation is, okay? So 
again, understanding what happens here is open from a mathematical point of view. My goal will be to understand what happens right before X star, and say up to X star, okay? Um, just a few words about the proof by Olenek. It relies on a nonlinear change of variable which is due to von Mises and which transforms the frontal equation into a local diffusion equation which looks like the porous medium equation. So I won't present that uh, change of variables here because as you will see during the talk there are uh, sufficiently uh, many changes of variables as it is but uh, I will use it as a black box in the following way. So uh, uh, the, the way Olenik does her proof is that she only works in the new variables, and since this is a diffusion equation, it has nice maximum comparison principles, so she builds up some, um, uh, some sub-solutions and uh, super-solutions for her new equation, she gets bounds and so on, and then she can prove well both nets, okay? So this is also something that we will do, but we will use that as a black box again, because thanks to this uh, nonlinear change of variables, it's easy to see that monotonicity is preserved. Oh yes, and I w haven't said why I wanted to work with monotone solutions. So I want to work with monotone solutions so that um, I'm sure that separation happens at y equals zero, because just to draw uh, a quick picture, if you have a velocity profile which looks like this, so which is not monotone, okay, um, what might happen is that at a later time, so this is u and this is y, what might happen is that at a later time you get something like this, okay? So this is the point at which you have u equals zero and y of u equals zero and I would like to avoid that. I want to be sure that the point at which I have these two conditions is at y equals zero. Otherwise, the analysis might get too complicated. And monotonicity is something which ensures that in a rather easy way, and it will also come up at several points in the proof, so it's a, a nice frame, framework, okay? But that, that's the main reason why we wanted to work with um, monotone solutions in the beginning. So, uh, and also if you work with monotone solutions, you have a nice comparison principle for the frontal equation because, uh, again, uh, coming from, this, um, from these other variables, because if you cook up some super or sub-solutions for frontal, you get a super solution in the von Mises variable. In this uh, diffusion equation, you can get the maximum principle, so you, uh, get uh, a comparison principle in for the, the other variables, and then thanks to ODE arguments, you can come back to the frontal equation, okay? So you, we will use as a black box this comparison principle for the solutions of the frontal equation. Okay, so now just a few results about the behavior near separation, uh, a few previous results. So there were first some attempts which were made by the Goldstein in 48 and Stewartson 10 years later to compute some exact solutions, both before and after the separation um, point thanks to uh, Taylor expansions in self-similar variables. So I uh, must say that I don't really love these two articles because I think that they don't give that much uh, of an insight on the, the behavior near separation. In fact, they kind of give the wrong insight. But they rely on the fact that uh, the Poincaré equation has an invariance by scaling, which is the following, okay? So which, um, and so then, so we have some powers uh, here on, uh, of mu depending on x, y is scaled like mu to the one fourth. And so Goldstein tried to uh, compute an asymptotic expansion for the stream function in these rescaled variables. Stewartson did that for the derivative of u in the same variables, and that's slightly better because it basically allows for logarithms in the expansion of u. <coughs> but in both cases, the coefficients of the asymptotic expansion are never entirely determined. Stewartson assumed that it's because you might have some dependence of the coefficients on the initial data. 
but this wasn't completely satisfying and it was really something which was formal. So it, um, people tried to come up with a rigorous mathematical proof. And then there was also a proof by Landau, which in fact does give the right uh, self-similar rate. So Landau's characterization of the separation point wasn't the one which is given usually in the physics literature and which is the one that I gave here. It's rather that at the point of separation, since the flow leaves the boundary layer, in fact, the derivation of the Pontot equation becomes uh, false, okay? So you have an infinite normal velocity at that point and an infinite uh, derivative of the normal velocity at that point, okay? Be just because the flow will leave the boundary layer, okay? And from there, he infers that, so uh, this derivative is the inverse of this one. Thanks to the divergence free condition, it's minus uh, this quantity, which is zero, since this is infinite, okay? And then he computes an asymptotic expansion for x minus x star, which, since this first derivative is zero, must be like up to the square. And from there, he gets that the derivative of up must k like square root of x square minus x star minus x. And uh, this is in fact the rate that we find as well. Although I, well, uh, it's not that I cannot make much sense of this proof, it's just that I don't quite see how to make it work mathematically, okay? But he did have the, 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 the correct um, separation rate, which isn't completely the one that was, the, was um, assumed by Goldstein and Sewarson which was more like x star minus x to the one-fourth. And then there was a, a first attempt at a mathematical proof of this by Caffarelli and E. And so in a paper which was published in 2000, Wayne and E announced a result with uh, Luis Caffarelli, which uh, stated the following. So he assumed that he had an adverse pressure gradient, an initial data which satisfied a special condition. So this is not monotonicity, but it's something which is related, okay? Um, and then, so he said that there exists some, some points as such that the solution cannot be extended beyond it, okay? And when you consider the rescaled family, so this is exactly the uh, invariant scale scaling, this is something which is compact in uh, C of R2 plus. And the author also stated two non-trivial lemmas, which uh, really seem to um, use the structure of the equation and which were supposed to play a key role in the proof and relied on the maximum principle. But unfortunately, they never published the complete proof. And uh, when we first started um, working on this, I tried to um, you know, fill in the blanks, but I wasn't able to prove any of it, actually. Uh, neither, the, neither the lemmas nor the, the final statement starting from the lemmas, nothing. I could more or less understand where the quantities were coming from, but that's about it. But obviously I'm not as much an expert as they are in um, the manipulation of the maximum principle. So that, that, that doesn't mean anything, but still well, we weren't able to, uh, well, to, to, to fill in the blanks. And so we decided to go a different way. And Nader remarked that uh, this kind of singularity formation was very reminiscent of what happens for the equations such, that, uh, such as the Schrodinger equation for which you have blow-up phenomena. And uh, he decided, well, he uh, suggested that we uh, look into these results and try to apply them to our problem to find a kind of self-similar rate for the singularity. So we, uh, we want to give a, a more quantitative result and we came up with the following. So we consider the same, still the frontal equation with an adverse pressure gradient. And we consider an initial data, like I said, which is also always uh, monotonous with respect to y, and which behaves like this quantity for uh, y close to one. The y two over two just comes from the one here, okay? And with a very small derivative, which means that we're close to the separation point. Okay, and what we were able to prove is that when you look at the derivative of up at y equals zero, 
then it scales like x star minus x, so this is exactly the rate which was predicted by Landau. And uh, we're also able to give some um, uh, estimates on the Ponzol equation minus some kind of approximate solution, which we compute explicitly, okay? Depending on this uh, derivative lambda of x. So uh, let me just stress that there are two results here. The first result is understanding the, the asymptotic behavior of the derivative, and the second one is to have an error estimate. <clears throat> like I said, the rate is the one predicted by Landau, but we don't know if, if, uh, if there are other unstable rates. So the conjecture would be that you can obtain like, uh, something like x star minus x to the power alpha for any alpha between one fourth and one half, something like that. Mm. But it's not very clear that uh, all these rates are stable or not. And so if we try to compare uh, our result with the one which was announced by Caffarelli and E some 20 years ago, so uh, it encompasses the result. Obviously our uh, assumptions are much, much more stringent. Okay, we need much more assumptions on the initial data. But the limit is identified, which was not the case. They weren't able to identify the limit. They just had a capacity um, along a subsequence, and it's quantitative. Okay. And so, the, like I said, the, the tools of the proof are very inspired by the study of blow-up rates for NLS, which were, um, uh, which were so the, the methods were uh, elaborated by Merle and Raphael some 10 years ago, and which have been successfully applied to uh, various equations, such as wave maps, Schrodinger maps, the keller segal system, the harmonic heat flow. And I thought that maybe I would, um, present these results here today because uh, there are, these are results that are fairly well, uh, techniques which are fairly well known now in the dispersive community. And obviously the intersection between the dispersive community and the hyperbolic community is uh, non empty. But uh, I'm not sure that these techniques are that well known uh, uh, um, along the, among the whole hyperbolic community. And I'm not sure that it's specific to uh, dispersive equations. Okay, my uh, understanding of it is that it strongly relies on a self-similarity, uh, on some scaling invariance in the equation, but not that much on the dispersive nature. Okay, so I thought it was interesting to, uh, to present it here. So the idea is to perform a self-similar change of variables and then do everything in the new variables, both cook up some approximate solution and perform the energy estimates and the techniques are based on the uh, modulation of variables, which is really a beautiful idea due to Merlin Raphael. So let me present the self-similar change of variables. So the uh, unknown, what you, want to, what you are looking for, is the derivative of QP at point y equals zero, which I call lambda of x. And then you use the scaling invariance of the equation so you perform this, uh, this change of variables, okay, based on lambda of x. And you come up, when you plug this into the equation, you come up with this kind of equation, which uh, for the time being at least doesn't look so nice for you tilde. So let me just point out uh, a couple of things. Here, what you have is exactly the advection term. So this is still the viscosity term. So if you forget about that, uh, <coughs> <coughs> what is written here is basically the scaling invariance of the equation, okay? And so if lambda were constant, you wouldn't have this, okay, lambda x is zero, and I would just have written the scaling invariance of the equation. But because lambda is non-constant, you have this additional term here, and, um, and in fact, it's the balance between these two terms which dictates the self-similar rate, okay? So, then you can try to make the equation look a bit better. So uh, you define dx over dx equal lambda four. So you change the time-like variable from x into s. So that uh, cancels out this term. And you define b, which is proportional to lambda x, lambda three, so that this term is just b. And uh, so the new function is capital U, and it's the one that I will use in the rest of the talk. And now it satisfies this equation. So again, if you forget about the purple term here, you get exactly the same equation as before. This is just scaling invariance. 
and it's the balance between this nonlinear term and this one, which dictates what the behavior for B is, okay, what, what kind of equation B satisfies, and this is what gives you the self-similar rate in the end, okay? And the re so I will uh, study this equation, which is the rescaled equation R in the rest of the talk. Again, S is a time-like variable. X going to S star corresponds to S going to infinity, at least if this condition is satisfied, which will be the case in what follows. So from now on, I only work on this equation. And at this stage, there are two unknowns, basically, U and B. So the approximate solution you, you have to come up with has to um, give you the asymptotic behavior both of U and B, okay? And the asymptotic behavior for B dictates the self-similar rate. So the scheme of proof is to construct an approximate solution mainly for U. At some point in uh, the construction of the approximate solution, you have several choices for the behavior of B. And you have to uh, choose B so that your approximate solution has the least gr possible growth, okay? This is not something that I, uh, well, I, I understand it in the, obviously in the step-by-step -step proof. This is also th something that comes up in the papers by Merle and Raphael, but it's not, um, let's say, a strong mathematical principle. It's just something that you realize that if you make a different choice, then the proof fails, okay? So I, I will explain this in, uh, in a few moments. And then you perform some energy estimate on the remainder of the solution. And something to keep in mind is that the expected rate lambda of x corresponds to b equals two over s when you uh, do all the computations. And this corresponds to bs plus b square over two equals zero. So this quantity, bs plus b square over two, is uh, basically what pilots the, 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 the self-similar rate. Um, and if I just have time for a, a short comment here. Here, uh, in fact, maybe, maybe I can go back one slide. Um, the choice of coefficient four here basically tells you that this is a, a work which is still quite young. Because when we, uh, first starting, started doing computations of, on this, we didn't expect to have this similar, self-similar rate, but rather something like x uh, star minus x to the one-fourth. And this is why we have a four here, okay? Uh, I, I realized that when I was writing the slide and I didn't want to change anything because I feared uh, I would make some mistakes because we did other computations uh, in the following months with this kind of thing, but obviously, this might not be the best choice because you have uh, coefficients everywhere. So this is just a remark to tell you that this is a rather young work. But you, you shouldn't focus on this coefficient, it's really irrelevant. Okay, so um, what I want to prove is that bs plus b square over two is something which is small and say smaller than b square, okay? So the sketch of proof is as follows. You first compute the approximate solution. So again, this is the equation on u. I have called capital A uh, the nonlinear uh, non part of the equation. And so the binary conditions at xi equals zero, so xi is my rescaled normal variable, are the following. So you still have a Dirichlet condition. This is uh, inherited from the equation. And by definition of lambda, by the very choice of lambda, the xi derivative of u at xi equals zero is one, okay? So you know that your solution starts like xi. And then you plug this into the equation and you perform some Taylor expansion of your solution near zero, okay? Or if you want, you uh, compute all the derivatives of uh, u at point uh, x equal zero. And so you find that u, s of, uh, u of s and xi behaves like xi plus xi square over two plus something b, uh, b xi square. And so your uh, algorithm is pretty simple. You start with this polynomial and you plug it into the equation, you look for the remainder. this gives you uh, the additional term and so on, okay? So uh, you have several ways to look at it. I guess the one that I like best is this one. So you have your uh, solution un, you plug it into your equation, you have a remainder, okay, which is uh, supposedly small. 
you integrate it twice, and this gives you the additional term in the asymptotic expansion. And you go on and on, and so you build uh, a Taylor expansion up to any order. And so now, how does this um, define your, uh, your growth rate? So I apologize. I have a couple of technical slides here. This is the um, uh, dentist part that uh, Pierre we alluded to in, the, in his talk yesterday. Uh, I'm afraid that if I wanted to explain how the proof worked, I, I, have, to, I have to go into a few technical details here. So let's say that I have computed my solution up to order four, okay, so this is U1. Okay, the coefficient alpha here is explicit. And when I look at the error term in the equation, I get something which is, uh, okay, still polynomial, so something of order xi5, xi6, and something which is uh, xi8, but as you can see, it has an additional b in front of it, so this one uh, I, I will forget. I'll just fo fo focus on these two, okay, because uh, they have the same, uh, the, the coefficient in front of them has the same order. And so what you want to do is push your Taylor expansion as far as possible. So in this remainder, you shouldn't think that xi is small, but rather that xi is large, because you want to push it really uh, far, far from xi equals zero, okay? And like I said, you want your, Taylor, you want your approximate solution to have the least possible growth. So if you keep something which scales like xi, six in the, in the remainder, then your additional term in the expansion will be xi to the eight, okay? If you keep this one, it will be xi to the seven. That's better, okay? Because it, it has less growth, okay? So that's why you uh, want to choose your b so that this one disappears. So you have no xi eight in your equation. You only have a xi to the seven in your approximate solution. Again, this is uh, something that I understand step by step, uh, fortunately, but uh, this is not the most rigorous mathematical principle that there is. It's just uh, something that allows you to cook up some approximate solutions. <coughs> so the answer is that in the uh, algorithm which defines you n, each time you have a bs, you replace it by minus b square over two, okay? And as a consequence, if you, uh, if you compute u minus un for n sufficiently large, u minus un in um, every kind of norm, either n infinity, l2, will control bs plus b square over two, okay? And so let me remind you that this corresponds exactly to the self-similar rate I wanted to find. Okay, so, um, then you, uh, you, you prove that you have the, the expected rate and that you have a, a, a nice approximate solution thanks to a bootstrap argument, so let me present that. So assume that you have an energy which controls your uh, self-similar rate, so say B, Bs plus B square over two to the, to the two because you're going to consider, so in the end you're going to uh, do some L2 estimates. And so your goal is to prove that this is lower than B to the fourth. Okay, and since B is supposed to be like one over S, you want to prove that your energy is better than S minus four, okay? And to do that, you use a bootstrap argument. So you, uh, you consider two S, S zero and S one large enough. You assume that this kind of inequality is valid at point S zero. You also have to assume that your uh, U is in between two nice, um, explicit actually, you uh, um, super and sub solutions. And you prove that the same estimates are true at point S1, which is at a later time, but with a better constant here, okay? And then you do some kind of induction and you infer that this estimate holds for all time. So you can either see it like that or um, the, the way that I, I prefer to, to look at it is saying that you start from a point where all this is satisfied, by continuity you will know that it's satisfied uh, for a small interval and you prove that you never leave this range. Okay, that this remains satisfied for all times. So this is a classical bootstrap argument which, uh, yes, which is, which is a, 
uh, fairly, fairly classical. Uh, I just wanted to insist a bit to, to on the, the, the two parts of the, the bootstrap argument. So the first part is maximum principal arguments. Because of the nonlinearity of the equation, you need some a priori and infinity estimates to close everything. You cannot choose just, say, uh, Sobolev in Bellings. This is not enough. You, you need some stronger and a priori and infinity estimate. And this is where we always use the comparison principle. So what we do is uh, we use as a black box the comparison principle, which is inherited from the von Mises variables, which I talked about in the first slides. Uh, so you construct some sub and super solutions which are basically based on your um, Taylor expansion. Uh, and then you prove that these, uh, this is propagated, okay? And you also need, so I uh, remained very vague on the assumptions I needed for you, but you also need some a priori estimates on a lot of quantities, such as uh, the derivative, the deriva second derivative minus one, and so on. And Concerning the energy, so you want to prove that uh, ES, which controls your, uh, say, error on the self-similar rate, uh, is scale like S uh, minus four minus something, okay? And so what you're going to prove is uh, an estimate of the following kind with some uh, dissipation rate here alpha, which is greater than four, and some eta prime, which is strictly positive, okay? And then when you integrate this, you get the bootstrap inequality. So just a few remarks. First, the remainder, which is here, this is technical but easy. It's just uh, you, you push far enough the, the, the asymptotic expansion for the, the, your approximate solution. Hopefully, you would get a small remainder, and then you will be done, okay? So this I won't talk about at all because it's just you know, pushing sufficiently far a Taylor expansion that should, that should be okay. Uh, the, the part which is not so obvious is how you get a good enough constant here. And this, in fact, is, uh, relies rather heavily on the structure of the equation. And this is achieved by algebraic manipulations on the equation, okay? So this is the, the part which um, I would... Uh, I will talk about in the rest of the talk, <coughs> and hopefully it's the last densest part. Okay, so now let me remind you what the equation is. So the equation is u u s minus u xi integral from zero to xi of u s minus b over two u square plus three b over four u xi integral of u xi u minus u xi xi <coughs> equals minus one. So here, if you look at the, the slide which is here, this is exactly something which I have called LU times US. Okay, because in the end I want to have an evolution equation on U which looks more like US plus some operator equals some remainder. Okay, so I want to invert that operator LU here to, uh, to have some kind of nicer equation. So this is what I've called my uh, operator LU. Uh, you can easily see that it's equal to, to this quantity, and so you can invert it rather easily. And so basically, LU minus one, LU is like multiplication by U, LU minus one is like division by U, okay? So close to zero, it's like division by Xi, and far from zero, it's like division by Xi squared. Okay, and the nice thing is that if you apply LU minus one to your equation, so this just becomes US. Uh, you, this is, uh, you, you have a defined LU specifically uh, in that code. But no, the nice part is that if you apply it to this nonlinear term here, you get something which is linear <coughs> here, which is just a zero order term plus a transport, okay? And then you the only linear nonlinearity in the equation now it's just in the diffusion term here, okay? And so you decompose U into some kind of, uh, some approximate solution based on the Taylor expansion plus some remainder. And now the equation on V is the following. So you have a linear part with a transport and zero order term and this is the diffusion, okay? And so, uh, um, now you're going to perform some um, 
energy, some L2 estimates on V. And if you remember, the, uh, what you want to do, what you want is to have some strong dissipation on the energy, okay? So we wanted to have some uh, alpha, which was greater than four, if you recall. So there are a few facts here. So first, V controls your dissipation rate, and this is a positive operator, which is, uh, which is nice. And so, but when you look at the equation, and when you look at this term in particular, this is bad, okay? This will make the L2 norm grow, for instance. So you have to uh, somehow cancel out that term. So the way you do that is that you differentiate the equation su a sufficient number of times, or, which is more or less equivalent, you apply the operator L u, or you use some weights, so that this term comes into play. Because, for instance, if you see that if you differentiate it enough, uh, the commutator coming from here will destroy this one, and you will get something which is positive. So you just have to do that uh, enough times to, to, to get a strong decay of your energy. Okay, so your energy will be something like that in the end. So you apply the operator LU twice. So this is like division by U and derivatives. So it, uh, it, this term becomes better when you apply LU. Then if xi is close to zero, this will give you the strongest uh, dissipation in the energy, the strongest yeah, uh, loss of energy. And if xi is large, this one is the better one, and you, then you have to cook up a weight, okay? So these are basically the ideas, but again, I insist on the fact that here you have to strongly use the structure of the equation so that you have a high enough decay rate for the energy. This is, uh, this is the main point. And then you can perform some further error estimates because the one that I did up to here are not so much to have a good um, error estimate with the approximate solution as to have the correct uh, dissipation rate here, okay? But once you know that you have a good, estimate, a good estimate for Bs plus B square over two, for instance, you don't need to have such a high decay rate on your energy and so on. And so you can have, uh, you can work with some other weights, and in order to have some, uh, some estimates for your uh, approximate solution further from uh, xi equals zero, okay? But this is work in progress, so I don't know exactly uh, how good the estimates, uh, how, how good are the estimates we, uh, we can have. So I won't say much about that. So conclude, so what we did was prove uh, separation for the stationary Poincaré equation in the case of an adverse pressure gradient, specifically with a pressure gradient which is equal to one. And we computed a self-similar rate which was compatible with Landau's prediction. The, we also performed some uh, quantitative error estimates in some kind of weighted HS spaces. And the uh, the funny thing is, is that it relies on arguments which are close to singularity formation from some uh, dispersive equations, rather than some maximum principle exclusively. So you have to use both, but the crucial thing, uh, the crucial things here are the um, self-similarity of the equation, well, the scaling invariance of the equation, and the fact that you have a, like I said, a special structure and a maximum principle. You need these three ingredients to make everything work. Okay. And some perspectives. So first, we, I, I haven't said anything about uh, stability, for instance, in HS. I, I don't know if that will work or not. For, for the moment, we really need these uh, um, estimates in L infinity, so I'm not sure. But the, um, the main perspective is understanding what happens after the separation point, okay? So uh, Several, several warnings. The first one is that you can have a lot of different uh, regimes, both turbulent and laminar ones. Clearly, the turbulent regimes are, I think, out of reach for the time being, even if, uh, like was uh, presented in uh, Laszlo Sekulady's work yesterday, there, there has been tremendous progress in this question in the last years. The other thing is that even in the laminar regime, the validity of the Pondal system after separation is far from clear. So let me try to, to explain this. So in the pictures you have of separation, so say that you have this, uh, this cylinder, okay? 
and you have the streamlines which follow your cylinder and then which become detached, something like that, okay? So if you say that you are going to use the, the Pontal equation to describe uh, your flow after separation, so you're working in something like this. So my problem is that in this neighborhood, okay, here, you have something which is no longer mi microscopic, okay? The typical scale of this I is one. It's not square root of nu. So it's not clear at all whether the Pontal equations are a good description of this. The only case in which the Pontal equation would be a good description of separation, after separation, I mean, is uh, if you have a picture which is more like this. Maybe I'll draw another one right next to it. So we, this won't be described by the Pontal equation. I mean, it, it just can't be. The, the, the picture here is macroscopic. But if you have something which goes like this, so the streamlines follow, and there you have a separation, but which remains very close, okay? So if this is still square root of nu, then things might work. But this is the only case, and it's not, not something that you see that often in pictures. So I don't really know. What I do know is that some physicists actually work on that problem, that they have computed some trip solutions which they call triple deck solutions or interactive boundary layer solutions, and that seem to be stable numerically and to give some reasonable results. So this is in a, in a, in a laminar regime in this kind of, um, of asymptotics, and they seem to be superposing different boundary layers on top of one another. So I don't really understand what they're doing uh, for now, so I haven't looked into it much. But there definitely seems to be something, because they're, since they, they are obtain, obtaining something which is stable numerically, there's, prob there's probably something into it, okay? Because uh, before we were aware of that, our idea was rather to, uh, so after separation, to look at something like this. Um, so if you remember, when you have u negative, you have the backwards heat equation, so you have to solve everything backwards. Okay, so the idea would be something like you solve the Pontal equation, Pontal equation in um, this direction under the separation line, in this direction under, below the separation line, but then you need some initial data here, okay? And here you have some kind of free boundary. Okay, so, but I don't know if this, is, uh, if this is reasonable or not. I mean, needing uh, an initial condition here is not something which I find very satisfying, so I don't know. Okay, so, but these are the main directions that we would like to work in, and um, I think I'll stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you.